I think this is a really important thing in our in our modern world is to really kind of connect people to what is behind your product. Welcome, neighbors, to Hometown Earth, the podcast that brings a down-to-earth approach to all of your sustainability questions. I'm your host, Lena Sanford, here on the Believe Podcast Network, the number one podcast network for professionals. Here, we believe that everyone can change the world. Do you believe? I'm a Midwest gal with big dreams to discover what it takes to reduce my impact on this beautiful place we call Hometown Earth. Join me every Tuesday as we navigate what actions we can take, big or small, to make a positive impact in your life and the lives of your neighbors on Hometown Earth. Are you ready when inspiration strikes? Now you can take notes while listening to Hometown Earth, write quotes, facts, or even journal with our limited collection of pocket notebooks. Designed by a local artist and produced on 100% recycled paper, these will be your new favorite on-the-go notepads. Get yours today at lenasanford.com forward slash shop. Hello, neighbors. I'm pretty sure anytime one of us puts on a pair of sunglasses, we instantly feel really cool. Am I right? Well, you're about to meet a sunglasses company that not only makes you look and feel good, but see the world better. Paula Eyewear creates designer, sustainable, and ethical sunglasses. And today you get to hear from the founder, John Pritchard. Their story starts as all great stories do, finding passion and purpose. In his 20s, John traveled around Africa and fell in love with the beautiful places, people, and communities along the way. Years later, he was moved by an article reporting that there were 1.2 billion people worldwide with poor vision, simply because they don't have access to glasses. Africa has 73% more visually impaired people than other regions, yet a pair of sunglasses is recognized as the number one tool to fight poverty, enabling and empowering people to read, learn, and work. John knew something had to be done, so he set about creating a company that gives back while being kind to the planet. It was about connecting the dots and helping others to see as well. Paul was established in 2016 with a mission to inspire us all to see the world better. And they fund eye care projects across Africa using profits from each pair of sunglasses sold. The evolving sustainable collection of design-led sunglasses are made in small batch production at a family-run factory in Italy using eco-friendly products to maximize impact on people while minimizing impact on the planet. It's amazing the impact that Paula is making with help from other organizations and their customers. And I have a feeling after this episode, you're going to be one too. You can absolutely tell John is passionate about Paula's work. And in this episode, he shares some of that passion and story with us. So put on your shades and get ready to hear John Pritchard with Paula Eyewear. Well, John, thank you so much for joining us here on Hometown Earth today. In the past couple of weeks, we've really been talking a lot about the fashion industry and you know how it's not just an item of clothing or an accessory that you're wearing, but it really has a story behind everything. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how the Paula story started? Well, thank you, first of all, for inviting me. Um, I love having a chat, so uh, even better when it's talking about my company. So yeah, thank you for that. So I began really thinking about it, the company as an idea about 10 years ago. And in fact, it was way back when, when I used to work at Microsoft, we had uh, like an event over in the US and there was Blake Mykowski from Tom's Shoes there where he was talking about sort of social impact with his shoes and then just put a little trigger in my head back back there and kind of wind the clock forward um, and I was still working at Microsoft but I was kind of feeling there was a bit of a gap in what I was looking for in my in my work and, and that missing piece very much being purpose. Um, lovely, great company to work for Microsoft. But there was nothing that I could really hold on to and think, what can I actually do? You know, I've got a chance. I've got a, a sort of, I'm in a position of privilege to maybe do something. And so really Parler came about, uh, I've been traveling to Africa for 
uh, in my sort of earlier uh, years. Uh, I had a real affinity for the people that I met, uh, the places I'd gone to, the beautiful vistas, culture, uh, and but also recognised that uh, in, in Africa in particular, uh, the lack of access to eye care is is pretty horrific. Um, you go to a country like uh, Sierra Leone, they've got four optometrists for a whole country. <laughs> you know, we can walk outside and probably find an optician with four optimi- optometrists just down our street. So, so there's a real disparity there. And, um, and yet a pair of glasses uh, or spectacles or corrective eye surgery is one of the most cost-effective, poverty alleviating tools you can give someone. So that real simplicity of a solution for me was what was the foundation of Parlour. So... Uh, and I went to a, a charity based here in the UK called Vision Aid Overseas. They work in four countries uh, in Africa. And I say, well, look, I, I, I want to go away and, and create a business. Uh, if you can help me with the impact work, then, then, then let, let's do something together. And obviously they were like, well, if you're going to give us some money, yeah, we, we'll work with you. So that was, um, yeah. that was probably a very easy conversation. The harder bit was going away and, and starting a business and, uh, I went for the obvious, you know, maybe that Tom's kind of model in the back of my head. Let's create eyewear to uh, create a change in eye care um, across countries in Africa. Um, but I came from a completely non-fashion background. And I still, people tell me I'm not very fashionable. Um, that will never change. <laughs> uh, and little, you know, no, no, in, no uh, background in eyewear at all. So I really had to kind of start from scratch and, and sort of cobble people that knew people who knew other people um that would maybe know an eyewear designer or maybe access to a factory and it just took some time but i did this all in the background side by siding while i was working in microsoft until the time came when i thought well it's time to kind of you know either fly or die sort of thing so uh, i launched a business yeah about five and a half years ago maybe um and it was it was fundamentally founded on uh, that social cause of eye care in africa so uniting the sales to grants and projects uh, eye care projects in Africa, but but clearly it's, it's it's that social impact has always been front and center. But environment has always been close to my heart too. So wherever we've tried to develop as a business, um, I've always tried to kind of put sustainable elements into the brand. I'm a very big advocate of making small changes and and learning and and you yeah. know an accumulation of small changes is far better than trying to make one big change and failing. So um, yeah, I've probably gone off on a bit of a tangent there, but. Your question was about so no. how I first started. That that pretty much covers the starting part, at least. Yeah, well, that's exactly what we are trying to do here on this podcast is to, you know, make these incremental changes that really do add up. And you say you're not fashionable, but the <laughs> these glasses are extremely fashionable. And you did a really good job of kind of putting that team together to make sure that your impact really did. It, I mean, you truly make an impact with Paula. So you know, you've even said you started from, uh, you know, not having any background in this at all and kind of planting that seed with hearing Tom about Tom's. And now you want to be the most sustainable eyewear brand on the planet. Uh, why is this such like a big challenge and how close are you to being where you want to be with this company? Uh, well, it's a big challenge because it's a challenge that you'll never, ever achieve. Um, you can't be by any stretch perfectly sustainable by by virtue of just being a manufacturer of eyewear we are having an impact on the planet so um but i think there are ways and avenues of being more sustainable and and in particular uh managing our environmental impact and the social impact that we're having um puts us in a good position at least to have a lot more sort of arrows to the bow in terms of or or pillars so to speak of sustainability sustainability itself is a very broad word one person's view of sustainability could be very different from another's a a case in point being we make our our cases in in ghana we work with weaving communities out there to make our cases and recycle plastic waste now i could get those cases made in the uk um, and mitigate the carbon impact of flying them to the uk but for me it's more important that I'm sustaining those communities, paying them a very good wage, uh, using recycled materials, so lessening the impacts lo- locally in the environment there. So it's always, sustainability is never something that you'll ever be on top of. Uh, there'll always be conflict. I always use the cucumber as a good example. You know, we go to the supermarket, it's wrapped in plastic, but the fact that it's wrapped in plastic <laughs> means that the shelf life yeah. is three times the length of a normal one. So you don't have to you don't have to stick it in lorries and trucks so often to, to take it to, to, to the store. So you've got longevity of a cucumber. 
versus you know versus the use of plastic to preserve that longevity so there's always going to be conflict um so that's why our sustainable mission will always be ongoing but there are several ways to sort of slice and dice that that um sustainability conversation and it's it's about making small or little and often changes as i go back to my earlier point we never set up to be perfect right from the start Otherwise, you'd never launch a company because you, you simply can't have everything in play to do that. We, we've just over the years have sort of started to fine tune and get better. But of course, there will be better solutions still and, and technology and, and innovation will help us uh, mitigate our impact even more. And, and in the meantime, you know, we try and be advocates and, and talk about it. And that's why these podcasts are, are fantastic, because it gives us a chance to to be open and honest and say, look, we, we're, we're doing the best we can. We know we're not perfect, but but hear us out and and, and, and support us. And we'll, we'll keep trying to uh, achieve even better, better results for the future. But that goes to any any company, any manufacturer out there. Um, you'd, you'd like to think that the more companies that are trying to take this more sustainable course will influence the other other brands and maybe the bigger brands out there that uh, perhaps don't really have sustainability as a as a core metric for their success. Well, I liked what you said there about, you know, it's not just, you know, the carbon footprint or not just the communities. It's kind of the entire impact of, you know, what you're doing and sustainability is a more holistic view. It's the pieces that make up the whole. So Let's kind of talk about that, like the the pieces of the sunglasses. And if you sat down a pair in front of um, a listener, let's kind of walk through maybe the the whole look of each piece. You mentioned the the case there. Like let's let's hear a little bit more about the story from that all the way to the actual lenses themselves. What makes each piece sustainable and ethical? Um, kind of the highlight version. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep it brief. I, to be honest, the, the cases, I think, the story behind the cases is is, is arguably more powerful than the, than the sunglasses or the eyewear. Um, yeah. We, we, I wanted to find a solution that, that could take us back to, to Africa again and, and, and as much as possible try and keep our stories connected uh, to helping empower and, and improve livelihoods. And I was lucky to meet someone over here in the UK. I live in Brighton on the South Coast and, and I was introduced to someone who only lives about 10 miles away. He runs a weaving NGO over in Ghana called Careful Basket. And uh, the weavers in Bolgatanga, which is Upper East Ghana, make beautiful uh, woven baskets out of straw or, or traditionally out of straw. We decided to see if we could innovate and get them to weave our cases, um, which I hadn't done before, about six months of prototyping. And we had a very, what is our our case today and it has been since the start a very sort of a, a basic looking case but fundamentally it doesn't need any other uh mechanical element to it other than the weavers just weaving the finished product and that's very important that it doesn't have any more steps in the chain or any other materials that we have to bring in right now we use recycled plastic waste for those, for, for those cases there is a uh a, it's a plastic bag stroke uh water sachet making factory in accra in in the capital of ghana and uh, we take their waste uh, plastic so it's kind of a the spooled plastic that you know we're doing a print on it and it it, it doesn't work so it gets ripped off uh, the the reels and gets set to one yeah. side so we get all this it's basically the secondary waste from, from from there and we also use water sachets um so any of our cases you'll see there's some sort of pale blue and white uh, white stripes and these are water sachets um we use six in each case there's a Problem with the waterbed in in Ghana, and that it was uh, poisoned by lots of pesticides um, from the US or other countries back in the early fifties and sixties. And yeah. so, actually, the, the groundwater you can't drink uh, for not, like another hundred years. So they have to import all their water, and and you can't drink out of taps. So they have to use water sachets to drink from. So each person has about maybe drink yeah. ten to twelve of these a day, uh, and then they just throw them on the ground. So what we're trying to do is saying, well, actually, by using a water sachet in our case, then actually we're, we're, we're engendering a, a change where people, rather than throw it on the ground, will think, actually, this has got a very small piece of value because it's part of what goes into a case. I think we've reintroduced it about two years ago, and, and I think there's about 32,000 water sachets now have been used in our cases. So that's 32,000 sachets that would have otherwise been thrown on the ground. So it's just a small thing like that. But the other thing, the important thing maybe is that climate change has had quite a significant impact on the communities up in Bulgatanga. Uh, we were visited there three years ago and they get far more drought than they used to. 
and it's a traditional farming community. Yeah. So the crops are not as good by any stretch as they used to be. Soil is pretty ruined. And so actually, um, and also the elephant grass or the straw that they would traditionally use has, has moved further down country where there's more water and, and it can thrive better. So actually for the weavers, uh, you either had to go and travel by bus uh, and, and, and sort of go into the bush and find the straw, be open to all the issues of women traveling alone in the bush. Um, or you can have plastic delivered to your doorstep and you can use a material that's, that means you don't have to do that. It's climate proof in that sense as well, albeit plastic, but it's recycled plastic and it's, it's enabling yeah. these communities to use a material that they don't have to worry about whether they're going to get a crop of it next year. So on a number of levels, it really is, um, it's a really interesting soil for the cases. And each case we have has a, has a name of the weaver on a label. And it's, it's important, that, it's important for them actually, that they want, they want whoever buys our sunglasses and the case that comes with it, recognize that they are, you know, they, they were the person, that's the name of the person that were your case. And I think this is a really important thing in our, in our modern world is to really kind of connect people to what is behind your product. It's an easy thing for us to do, and, and uh, it's an important that people don't lose sight of, oh, it's just another pair of sunglasses, or it's just another car glasses case. They're very artisanal. Some people love yeah. them. Some people think, oh, well, they're not kind of nice and smooth and whatever. Well, that's not the purpose of the case. The purpose is itself is a story, and it's a story of empowerment and hope for uh, the communities that make them. You know, I, I saw about, you know, the DDT pollution and everything that has caught, you know, climate change that's caused those issues there. So I really love that. I think it's an innovative solution because we obviously know there's too much plastic <laughs> that's in, in uh, you know, our world right now. So y'all have plenty to to go for for years to come. But I uh, really love that connection with the story because that's, you know, again, we value things a lot more deeply um, that we own if we can, you know, connect a story to that. Think about like, you know, any old family heirloom, even if you don't like it, you know, you're like, wow, this has a story that I that I want to keep and cherish this and value it and take care of it. And that's kind of when you make that connection, you know, with somebody that is you're you're building up a community, you know, the name of who made it. Um, it just makes you take care of it that much more and last that much longer. So I really love that. And then you've also kind of you use some recycled materials and um, plant based materials in the glasses themselves. Can you tell us just a, a little bit about that? Yeah. So for our so our frames, we use bioacetate um, and bioacetate is it is a plant based, a more plant based material. We've got to be very careful with greenwashing nowadays. I do see people saying that, you know, that our frames are 100%. There is still a plastic element to the frames. Right. But by using bioacetate, it is biodegradable. Um, and in, in the right conditions, again, I want to caveat because I'm very transparent. In the right industrial because uh, um, of composting conditions, then it will biodegrade by more than 90% within 115 days. So but we all know we can't go and throw out our sunglasses and they end up in a in that sort of situation. You can go and bury them in your garden, but the, the, the conditions aren't as perfect. So it would take a lot longer for them to biodegrade. So, but yeah, the, the, and ultimately, <laughs> it's, you, know, you don't want conditions to be so adverse that actually you buy a new pair of sunglasses and they sort of biodegrade when you're sitting out by the seaside. So it's, it's it'd be a very good business model. Every three months, somebody has to buy a new pair of sunglasses because they've dissolved. Yeah. But it's a more yeah, plant-based uh, material. It's around about 64 to 68% uh, of your frame is made um, from, from plant-based, uh, depending on the supplier that we've, we've got. And then the lenses as well. Um, again, I've looked at that and we use a lens which is 39, well, 39.5% 39 if you want to be exact, um, uh, castor bean oil based as well. So again, looking at renewable materials or sources in, in, our, in our lenses. So, and, and the metal is metal and it can be recycled. So the idea is, is that you can ultimately, when recycling kind of catches up, because I think there's a big, big, especially in the UK and even my local one down here in Brighton, to, to actually recycle a frame isn't that easy. And in fact, what I do for our UK customers, unfortunately, I can't do uh, internationally. But um, when we send a new frame, we take back any of their old frames. And I work with TerraCycle, which I think is a familiar company in the US as well. But they will break down the frames 
into component parts. The plastic parts get made back up into road cones and watering cans, et cetera. And then the metal parts get made up into little nuts and bolts and screws. So there is a, a kind of a circular model going on in there. Yeah, we just had TerraCycle on the show. So ah, really excited for the work that you're doing. And I saw that you'll work with them. So that's really awesome. Yeah. So so it's it's it, for me, it's the best way of of um, working with old frames. And my sort of ambition is that we we take more frames out of the system than we put in. Um, it's just it's not that easy to take materials or, or the waste materials or end of life product and putting that back into new frames. That's not such an easy process and maybe solve that conundrum. Um, and at the moment, unfortunately, there's no scalable, you know, in the UK, I think 350,000 frames get thrown out every month. Um, and that yeah. just pretty much ends up in landfill. Um, I can do it for my customers, but I certainly can't take 350,000 frames and do it. Yeah. So, so it's, yeah, it's, um, there's a, there's a solution there, um, for the sort of the end of life for our frames. Uh, maybe one day if we get a little bit bigger, we can roll it out to our U S customers, but, um, yeah, we've got to, we've got to grow a little bit first. Well, you, you, um, uh, mentioned transparency there and I just want to quickly kind of talk about that, you know, if you are extremely transparent from literally saying who, you know, puts these glasses together, their handcrafted glasses, all the way back to how you get the materials um, and even the standards that y'all hold for your suppliers and everybody in between. Why is, why is it so important to uh, Paula's mission to be transparent and ethical? I just, I just think the way people consume nowadays is changing. Um, we've got the B Corp movement, obviously far more advanced than the US and the UK, but the UK is really pushing through um, quite significantly now. You know, we're doubling in B Corp registrations uh, every year. And I just don't think people nowadays will tolerate buying a product. I mean, yes, yes, clearly people do at the moment, but I think as we go forwards, people will get less uh, tolerant of, of brands that are producing something where either the supply chain is is really poor and people aren't being paid enough or they don't know the output from, from the full supply chain, or it's materials that are non-renewable um, because we're all learning pretty fast that this planet's got a finite resource and what we're taking out, we've got to kind of give back. And if we're not giving anything back, there's going to be a problem down the line for everyone. You know, we're in a climate emergency, as everyone knows, there's unfortunately a lot of other distractions in the world right now, but the climate emergency yeah. won't go away and it will only get bigger and bolder and more in our faces as we see kind of, we'll see for ourselves the, uh, the, 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 you know, the changes in the weather systems, et cetera, and, and the loss of habitat and, and, and um, flora and fauna. So this storytelling is not going to go, it's only get greater and deeper. And then, Consumers have got to make a choice when it comes to when they're they're looking for their next T-shirt or their next you know food purchase or their next pair of sunglasses. Do I go for the one here which really hasn't isn't holding any ethics or any environmental um, benefits to me or the future, or do I go for this other brand here? Um, the designs are pretty much the same, so why wouldn't I go for the brand here which is trying its best to to have far far deeper resonance beyond just the physical product? And you know, for Parlo, I've kind of set it up to be that you buy a pair of sunglasses, and then you're triggering a lot of sort of little events by just by virtue of, of of working with us. It means us paying for another case to be made for, from another weaver in Ghana. We pay them almost three times the, the minimum yeah. wage. It's about empowerment. It's about them being able to afford the things that we take for granted. You know, they have to pay for hospital treatment. They have to pay for school school fees. So. It's it's about change, you know, far further and deeper down the line, and and I just think you have to be well, don't have to be at the moment, but I think those that aren't will find that they will lose their, they will lose their fans and followers um, over time, and the ones that have, have tried to set out their stall right from the start and are open and honest and and will answer all the questions and admit to where they're failing as well. I think that's very important. You have to admit where you're not doing so well. It's why the B Corp certification, I think, is very good. It allows for brands to talk about the good things, but also you might not be doing other things that so well. And you're kind of prompted in your assessment to kind of look at the next year. Okay, next year, well, look, let's set this up as a target. So it gives you targets and ambitions to be and obviously improving your score. So a very long answer yeah. to your question. But um, yeah, it's, I just think <laughs> um, companies won't, won't survive. 
I agree. I think that people are looking for, um, you know, a way to make a deeper impact and, that's exactly what y'all are doing, you know, that deeper resonance with people. And as far as, you know, we were talking about deep, you know, like I said, from the very moment, you know, you're thinking about these glasses up until they're made. And then even further, like that story runs so deep and it also creates um, a brighter future for other people. You kind of mentioned, you know, the impact that y'all are able to make through these glasses um, but could you just tell us a little bit about specifically how, you know, y'all give back with, you know, proceeds or otherwise and really provide hope to not just, you know, communities, but uh, honestly, to, to me and to the world that there's there's companies out there doing these great things. So, yeah, just brag on yourself and how y'all give back a little bit. <laughs> well, look, I, I'll, I'll talk about the work in uh, the eye care work, because that, that was fundamentally my impetus for for starting Parlour. Yeah, for me, it is the fact that this very simple notion of, of spectacles or uh, corrective surgery will mean that it might be for a, a, a school child or a student, the difference between reading the blackboard or reading books and, and, and a potentially a proper uh, education. But where I've been to in Ethiopia, it's a very hot, high cotton-based industry out there. Um, but if you haven't got a pair of glasses to thread a needle, you can't sew. And so it's these just simple, simple stories and yet give someone glasses and, and it's empowerment. It pro- it's proper empowerment. So... The way we work with Vision Aid overseas is we provide grants um, into their various projects. So they, they work in Ethiopia, as I say, uh, Zambia, uh, Ghana, um, and Sierra Leone. So in, in 2017, so quite near when we first started, uh, I was very keen to sort of you know, walk the talk, really. And, and we got involved in uh, refurbishing a, um, a vision center in Zambia and equipping that too. Um, and it serves a region that's in Quiha. And it serves a region of around 85,000 people. And uh, we now know that uh, at least 11,000 people have passed through that vision center since, since we launched, uh, all receiving either surgery or spectacles. Um, but there's also halo effects. They go out into schools and, and education, because education is very important. There's lots of cultural issues with uh, if people put glasses on, it's, sometimes it's frowned upon, it's seen as a negative thing. So you know, there's a lot more to it than just here's money, uh, here's a vision centre, et cetera. It's, it's the kind of the deeper conversations that are going on. And, and Zambia, again, I referenced the um, Sierra Leone project, which I'll talk about shortly, but Zambia until 2014 only had nine optometrists for a country which on UK terms is about three times bigger than our country. So again, it's a desperate situation, but we've had, say, just over 11,000 people pass through that vision centre. So potentially 11,000 people having a slightly better chance in life or opportunity to, to succeed. And, and that's really important. So, um, and we're going to launch very soon in about three weeks. So I really shouldn't be talking about this. Hey, you've got, you've got a world exclusive coming right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> we've got a project in Sierra Leone, uh, which I've just referenced, which we're going to be launching. Um, it's uh, in the Northern district. It doesn't have an eye center. Um, it will serve a region of 200,000 people. Um, so there is a building there which is going to be refurbished and we're going to equip. And if we get enough, we'll also train up uh, an optom as well to, to work. Because obviously, as a way of building the infrastructure, you've got to have the optometrists to do that as well. We obviously, I just want to caveat, we work with Vision Aid overseas, but they also work with local NGOs and government. So it is all very joined up. You know, it's very important to make aware it's not like, or parlor built, you know, refurbished this building and, and, and equip, equipped it, but there was nobody to, you know, sit in it. That will be covered off if we can't if we yeah. can't find uh, if we can't fund enough from our sales to do the opton part. That will be covered off by another partner or etc. So um, I just want to make that quite quite clear because some people might be going scratching their heads, going, "Well, hang on, how can you just go into a country and, and do this stuff?" It's it's actually very detailed, <laughs> and there's a lot of other uh, partners in, in, involved in doing it. But again, if if we if we succeed, so we'll be launching that. Um, well, we're we're kind of launching on our website at the end of this month, um, and I know Vision A will be launching it in June, and then it'll probably take about. The plan is to try and see if we can reach our our funding uh, for that by the end of well, within twelve months. 
And then because there is a building kind of there, um, so the infrastructure won't take, because you know, normally these projects will take 12 to 18 months to build, you know, build and complete. It might be that we could, once we've raised the funds uh, and delivered that, then the building build and, and, and equipping itself might only take as little as six months. So within the space of 18 months, maybe two years, that could be another vision center that we've we've got in in a very important part of the world, which just doesn't have the opportunity that we, we all can take for granted. Well, that's really exciting. And I appreciate you and everybody else that's involved in that doing that work, because I can only imagine how many hands it takes, but it's definitely necessary. And um, that's really exciting. Congratulations on that. <laughs> Thanks. I guess my next question then, what do you hope that, you know, once this pair of sunglasses and the case that it comes in is passed over to the new owner what do you hope that they feel or do when they're out in the world wearing Paula sunglasses? I guess I want them to feel a bit of the purpose that I felt when I, I was at Microsoft. Of, of you know, I wanted to put purpose into my, into my work. And therefore, in, in creating Parla, I've created a, a brand which then transfers that purpose onto our customers. So by buying a pair of sunglasses, they, they haven't just invested in a, a nice pair of frames on their face. They've actually invested in opportunities far further, uh, you know, 7,000 miles away, whoever you're based in, in the US or the UK or whatever, you know, you're having an impact much further away. And we will communicate that impact. We're not just sort of sticking up the odd photo. We want to ensure that you're kept up to speed with, with the impact you're creating. And not, it's not just a badging exercise. And we're very open. You can email us, let us know, you know, get in touch with us and, and, and we'll certainly respond and, and give you as much updated information uh, as, as possible. So really, it's just feeling a bit more connection to your product uh, rather than it just being, oh, I'm just going to get some sunglasses out of, the, out of the case. And you'll look at the case and think, oh, yeah, that's that's so and so who made my case. And, you know, I'm helping support a livelihood here. All these frames are, are, are made from bioacetate, so my impact on the planet is less because it's far more renewable material. And actually, they're biodegradable when uh, when the world catches up with biodegrad biodegradable and and uh, in terms of uh, being able to responsibly yeah. dispose of. But it's it's putting the best triggers in place for people to be able to have a, an impact. And as I say, when you know, when when we get even better at recycling and, and you know, biodegradable products as i've just mentioned there then then the impact will be even better we've still got sort of uh impact by virtue of being a manufacturer but we're, we're absolutely trying our best to make sure that uh, we're lessening the impact for our customers well i love that um i i'm just really excited because you know the what we're doing here with hometown earth the idea is that we're all neighbors we're all connected and paula really brings that connection and that story home because you know if i have something that a friend made me, I really love it. And I show it off. And I'm, I'm proud of that story that, you know, they, they handmade something and gave it to me. And that's exactly what Paul is. It's something that is a labor of love for, you know, people in the environment. Um, and, and they get to wear it, you know, their neighbors work. So I really love that. I, I noticed that there's a lot of interesting names for the glasses. Is there a, a story behind that? And what is your favorite pair of sunglasses right now? Okay, the first one's an easy one. All the names are derived from African words, um, mostly uh, Swahili. Uh, and uh, I won't go, from all, all, go through them all, but they they tend to be ones of positiveness. So it could be power or love or grace, all these kind of things. So um yeah, if anyone's got the time, they can go go for each one and look it up on the internet and, and find out. We probably <laughs> should do something, actually. We probably should do, um, maybe we'll do a post or something so people can just do a quick reference. Because it, it's funny enough, it's one of those things I've kind of, we've done and I've never really talked about. I mean, Parla itself comes from Impala, which is the native African antelope. And again, people don't know where that comes from. So we try as much as possible to, to always kind of resonate back to um, back to Africa. And now in answering that question, I've forgotten the second part of your question. So what's your what's your favorite, your favorite frame? pair right now? Ooh, um, you're going to love me, right? So it won't be a it won't be a frame, but it's on the <laughs> website. Uh, it was the, one of the frames from five years ago, and I still wear it. And um, yeah, I guess it goes back to my values, which is I, I won't replace a frame till it's it's 
it's sort of had its use of economic life. Um, it's a kind of a Wayfarer style, so pretty pretty standard shape nice. um, in that sense. But hey, look, I'm, I'm still using it and it serves my purpose well and it'll probably do it for another five years. So um, there's not something on the current site, but look, I mean, I've got a whole box of frames here. We just done a photo shoot. I have tried a few ones. So um, <laughs> I'd probably say the Lich frame, uh, which is uh, um, kind of a, a round frame. Uh, it's kind of, it's just, it's a really good frame for us anyway, commercially. Yeah. It's it's a really good unisex style. Uh, and I just love the angle. It's got some, just a few little delicate kind of uh, style, styling sort of parts to it. I like those, that pair. I know exactly what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. I'll, I'll caveat. I don't design our frames. Thank goodness. Um, that is left with the, to somebody <laughs> else. Um, but yeah, no, mm-hmm. it's, um, that frame is a really good unisex frame and it's actually quite timeless. And again, if you look at our collection, um, you'll see there's a lot of familiarish shapes. We like to feel that there's our own collection, you know, it's a parlor collection, but ultimately pretty much all those frames, there's some vintage cat eye, et cetera, but they're all timeless. And it's important that we don't create frames that are fashion forward, as i.e. they're in for 2022 and then they're out 2023. Because again, I don't want customers buying a frame for 12 months. It's not about that. So our collection is very much designed to be a pair that you'll wear, you'll wear until it's just beyond its economic use. And then you'll come back to the site and you can buy, you know, you'll buy exactly the same pair that you wanted to buy, or it might be in a few different colorways, et cetera. So again, it's, to me, it's a more sustainable way of, of, of working with our customers is to, is to, to not come up with like big and wacky frames that the sort of the celebrities and the Instagrammers tend to, tend to go for. Yeah. Well, is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to say before we hop off? I think it's been a really nice chat and, and yeah, you've kind of pulled as much out of me uh as possible and um you know I potentially was going to talk more about b corp but the us is much further ahead uh down the line it's particularly in the consumer world with b corp um and i'm just a big we became b corp in 2020 and i'm just a big advocate of that so i think uh it's maybe just a, a statement which is just go out and support b corps uh whichever service or industry or, or product or, or whatever they're doing because those are the companies who have got planet and people at the heart of their business and uh, if we want to see proper revolution in this world we need to support those and, and put the pressure i say it's all about trying to put pressure on the companies the bigger companies up the food chain the ones we kind of see on the high streets to think oh hang on they're taking a bit of our taking a bit of our pie or maybe we need to adjust our own and, and that's probably the best way from this kind of more grassroots i mean i say grassroots patagonia obviously aren't grassroots but it is from this kind of groundswell up that we will probably create change quicker yeah, well, that's really great. Well, I really appreciate this. What's the best way that uh, people can connect with Paula and, um, you know, just continue to hear about these stories? Uh, well, you can find us at parlorywear.com. Uh, you can find us on our Instagram, which is at parlorywear. Um, more than anything, actually, I, I, it'd be great if your, your followers would just sign up to our newsletter. It's something I haven't talked about, but again, we don't tend to ram too many kind of product uh, stories down down the line, or, or you know, this time of year. Yes, we will be talking about product because we're going into spring and summer. But um, we we tend to try and reach out to people who are at the the coal face of of climate change or social impact. So we've interviewed people like the chief scientist of the Barry Reef Foundation, and we've uh, interviewed interviewed a, a female scientist involved in microplastics in the ocean, because it's important to understand the problems that we have and learn how we're causing those problems. But they also, we also flip this because the part of strap line is see the world better. So at the end, we always ask, and what's, what solutions are coming down the line? So it's all about how do they see the world better? And I think that's the kind of content from our newsletter that is important, it's stuff that resonates with me. Um, and I just, you know, we, we're, we're hoping to come out with a lot more stories. It's not, you know, it's not reaching out to famous people and stuff. It's about everyday people who are making a difference. We can tell that story and, and hopefully inspire others to, to understand better the problems, but also maybe take an action or a small action, small positive action uh, for, for a better, better future. Well, thank you so much, John, for joining us. And uh, again, really, really appreciate this and look forward to continuing to see the great work that Paula and you and all these other organizations are doing. So um, thank you so much and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. It was a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.
I hope you enjoyed this episode of Hometown Earth as much as I did. Let us know by rating and subscribing so you never miss an episode. New episodes drop every week on Tuesday. Head to the show notes linked in the episode description for more details. And let us know in the comments what you want to hear next. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. And you can find more about the podcast on Instagram at Hometown Earth or connect with me personally at Lena Saintford. We all know change needs to happen. So let's get started right here at Hometown Earth.